Yeah. I don't think they're ready for this. Gotta give it Forget about it. Hey, yo, at the speed of sound. It's the world now, wax works compound. So gather around and witness something that is rarely found. The Database Building Block seminar series is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This program is made possible by Google. It's in growth. He's awesome. <laughs> go for it. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay, so quick intro. I won't go through all of this. Um, so I've been a software engineer for quite a long time. Um, the, so the first decade I was building enterprise apps with relational database backends. The next almost decade I was working with various data frameworks. And then the last 16 years I've been working with database infrastructure. Uh, so starting out with a database sharding product, uh, then building a custom SQL engine, which I later had to integrate with Spark. Uh, started learning about Spark, and this is where I kind of got interested and started hacking on data fusion, which I'll talk about more. But the last five years of my career have been focused on the, uh, accelerating Apache Spark, previously with NVIDIA with their Spark Graphics product, and more recently with Apple, where we're accelerating Spark using data fusion. So that's my kind of like career history. Um, I wanted, Andrew did a great job last week talking about data fusion. I just wanted to put in one slide talking about kind of my involvement, some of the history that might be interesting. So this started out as a personal project back in 2017. And originally the goal was to build um, kind of like a more modern Apache Spark. And I very quickly found out that that was like way too ambitious for a kind of weekend project. So after a while I pivoted to building a, an in-process query engine. And I took a lot of inspiration from the designing Cal site. I really wanted something that was kind of modular, um, with like clear layers between like the, the SQL parser and the logical plan and so on. And I found it much easier to build a community up around that because it's just like, a, compared to building something like Spark, it's just, you know, it's just way simpler. Um, the project's got donated to Apache Arrow in 2019 and it's kind of grown from there and obviously it has a lot of momentum now. Um, so once once that happens, I then had another go at building a, a, query, a distributed query engine I figured we, we have data fusion now, that's like a really good building block. So now what I have to do is the distributed bit. So I built the Ballista engine, uh, donated that to Apache Arrow. Unfortunately, that one's really kind of failed to gain traction and it's not very active now. And then data fusion went on to become the top level Apache project pretty recently, um, earlier on this year. And yeah, I've been working on the, the Comet project uh, since that time. So I'm not going to go into like the core data fusion too much. Andrew covered that really well last week. Um, so this is a quick, quick kind of recap. So the core of data fusion is a set of libraries that provide a complete query engine. So parsing, planning, execution, uh, support SQL data frame substrate, uh, the kind of front end, has support for various data sources and formats, um, uses of actually memory throughout. Um, so I think at this point, data fusion is fairly well known for that use case of being a foundation for new systems. I think what's maybe not so well known is that there are um, a bunch of sub projects that provide user facing kind of packages. So um, there, there are the data fusion Python bindings to start with. Uh, so, you know, from your Jupyter notebooks, you can just use data fusion to run queries. And then there are now there are three kind of distributed flavors. Comets, which we're talking about today, which is it's not so much a distributed data fusion because developers are using the Spark APIs. And data fusion is kind of in the background, um, like accelerating Spark. Uh, data fusion raised the newest sub project, and here developers are interacting with data fusion's APIs, but all of the distributed scheduling is kind of taken care of by Ray. And then there's the Ballista project that I mentioned, um, which really yeah, is, isn't very active now. <clears throat> I ran some quick benchmarks. This is CPCH, pretty small scale factor, uh, single node, just to kind of demonstrate. So using Spark as the baseline, um, coming right now is showing like some 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 good acceleration, but it's not as fast yet as the the other data fusion sub projects. And I'll be talking about you know why that is and the work that needs to happen to to get it there. Um, but Ballista and Ray, um, which are very similar really architecturally, we're seeing like you know around two and a half times faster than Spark. And then data fusion Python, which is just in process, is not distributed at all. We're seeing you know, three dot three dot six x, which is pretty good. So yeah, you know, why? I mean, so that's, there's an interesting question there, like why is the Python one so much faster than the distributed ones? And it comes down to how parallel and distributed query execution works. So if we look, so this is a, um, a query plan 
um, based on TPCH query one, and it's a it's an aggregate query. But the to, to run this you, like a query is basically that they're split up into stages where within each stage of the query, um, that query can be be executed in parallel across partitions of data. And then when partitioning changes, you have a new query stage. And between those query stages, you have something called an exchange operator. And that's basically responsible for repartitioning data and like transferring data to where it needs to be for the next part of the query um, to be performed. And I don't know, this is the diagram there. It's kind of starting on the right-hand side here. There's like a partial hash aggregate happens in all the partitions. We get some intermediate results. Um, and then to do the final, so so there could be duplicate values, like duplicate grouping keys, because it's running against these independent groups of data. So we do some repartitioning, and then we do like a final aggregate, which collapses it down. So we have like all the unique values that we need, and then maybe another repartition to do a source at the end. And comparing like data fusion Python, which is in process, all we're really doing there to transfer data around is sort of passing pointers between threads as we're kind of shuffling this data. Uh, but when we're working in a distributed system, typically the output of one query stage gets three partitions and then written to disk. There's typically an in like some kind of index file as well. And then when the next query stage needs that data, it has to request it, you know, typically over the network. So it's a pretty expensive process compared to a standalone system. Um, in some cases, there's a more efficient way of exchanging data called a broadcast, where it's a, where it's a small data set, uh, like often used with a hash join. If the build side is small, it can be kind of broadcast to all the other executors, so you don't have that kind of shuffling overhead. Okay, so let's give a quick overview of Spark. I'm sure people are familiar with Spark. But it started out as an academic project in AmpLab, and it's been around for more than 10 years now. Um, it has a very mature query planner and optimizer. It supports you know, all of the file systems and object stores. It's very general purpose. Um, so it's been used for all sorts of different use cases. And one of its strengths is that it's really easy to test locally. You can spark on your laptop, and then you can scale that to hundreds or even thousands of nodes to kind of scale up those um, ECL jobs or SQL pipelines. The downsides of Spark, really, in my mind, there are two. Uh, one, it's row-based. Um, so it's using like the Volcano model row-based. You have all these iterators getting one row at a time. There's a lot of overhead there. And Spark's you know, done a good job mitigating against that by using whole stage code gen, where Java code gets generated for multiple kind of operators, like a section of the plan that gets compiled. Um, that, that helps a lot. I, I think Spark kind of got a 2x in performance when that was introduced. But that does have some limitations. Um, it only works up to a certain amount of code, so you can get into situations where um, you can't rely on that. And the other downside is that it's JVM-based, and JVM does tend to be slower than native code. And there can also be issues with you know, memory overhead and garbage uh, collection. So given all of that, so Spark's a, a big mature system. It's not really practical just to, for anyone to come along and build like a new Spark replacement. Um, so there's a trend now towards accelerating Spark rather than replacing it. Uh, Databricks published their Photon paper a couple of years ago. Um, so Photon, they built a new vectorized query engine in C++, and they put that behind the Spark API, and they, they stated that they saw, on average, like a 3x speed up over their previous Spark runtime. And right now, there are three, <clears throat> three major open source Spark accelerators. There's Comet, which I'm talking about today. There's Apache Gluten, which is um, it was previously an Intel project. It's now incubating in, in Apache. And interestingly, that actually supports different query engines as backends. Uh, it supports ClickHouse. But when in the context of accelerating Spark, it's typically used with Matters Redox query engine, which is somewhat similar to Data Fusion. And then there's NVIDIA Spark Rapids, which uses the Rapids libraries like QDF um, to execute queries on GPU. So Comet, um, so Comet's a Spark accelerator. And what that basically means is that we take, so we're using Spark for all of the, you know, SQL, parsing, query planning. But when Spark gets to the physical plan, that's where the Comet plugin kicks in and translates the Spark plan into effectively a data fusion physical plan. And one of the big goals of the Comet project is to make sure, not, not just that we're making queries run faster, 
but we need to provide 100% compatibility with Spark. And, and that means compatibility with like all the individual versions of Spark. So we often see that behavior will change between like Spark 3.3 and 3.4. So we have to kind of keep up with all of that. Um, the project's pretty new. Um, so it was originally developed internally at Apple and donated to the Arrow project uh, like earlier this year in February. And currently it supports 11 operators and 111 expressions natively. And Spark has like more than 200 expressions. So there's definitely like some way to go there. So this at the high level diagram. So on the left-hand side, we have like an application that is using Spark. In Spark terminology, that's known as the driver. So this is where you're using the data frame SQL APIs. And then when you go to execute your query, basically the Spark scheduler um, will talk to the Spark workers, which will spin up executors. Then within those executors, that's where we're actually doing this, um, the, the conversion to the native plan and executing the plan natively. Diving into that in a bit more detail. So again, driver on the left. Um, so the first step of translation happens in the driver. And Spark's physical plan is basically a, a bunch of Scala classes nested in a tree structure. And in the driver, we our optimizer rule runs and we take those Scala classes and we translate them into an equivalent set of Comet Scala classes. And what we also do at this stage, we we build a like an intermediate represent representation of the query plan in protocol buffer format. And when these Scala objects get transferred to the executor, uh, we we kind of pass that protocol buffer um, IR and we do the translation. This is where we go into we go through JNI into Rust code at this point, and we take that and translate it into the data fusion plan, and we execute it. And in the ideal case, the whole plan is native. We're processing um, yeah, these batches of arrow data, and the output goes directly to a shuffle file. In a less ideal case, there could be a mix of like native operators and Spark operators, and in that case, there'd be a bit of bit more kind of back and forth between um, the kind of the, the Java and the native. All right, so it's, uh, Raz, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, and then same Zachary go afterwards? Yes. So. Um... Does the Apache uh, the data fusion comment is it trying in a, as a sidecar like in a different process? No, no. It's, 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 so it's all within the executive process. So it's all basically JNI in the executive. There are JNI calls calling down into into the Rust code. Mm, I see. Okay. And my question was: Do you plan to use Substrate to like ship that IR to the executor at some point, or look into that? That's a good question. So um, I, I, I wasn't involved in the project at the time they chose to have their own kind of IR. Um, but I think because there's, currently Comet is very tightly coupled, we're only trying to accelerate Spark. So I think it's just that for now, there's like a lot less engineering overhead and just having our own uh, simple IR very specific to Spark. Um, but yeah, I mean, architecturally, there's no reason why we couldn't replace that with substrates in the future. Um, I think as, as substrate ensures more, that could be an option. And that was you know, possibly open the doors to having a wider scope in comics where, you know, like the, the Gluten project, it doesn't just accelerate Spark, they accelerate other systems too. Comet could potentially do that in the future. And and if we were to do that, Substrate would be a good fit. So contrasting this with like the, the Photon stuff from, from Databricks, mm -hmm. uh, Gazelle, uh, Gluten, uh, Gazelle became Gluten, right? If, yeah. if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And then, then the, the RAP has won. Like in Photon, it's still the Spark physical plan, but then they, while it's running, they they sort of call out the JNI for like, you know, it was like the the low level operator calls. Uh, I don't know what Rapids and, and uh, Gluten do, but this is basically saying you you hijack the entire Spark plan, and then yep. that runs in, in entirely in Data Fusion. That's right. So and, and Gluten is very similar. And Gluten uses Substrate to do this. Um, okay. So I think Gluten and the Comet are more similar in that regard. Rapids um, is slightly different. So it has the Scala classes for the physical plan. And there's like, it's more granular. There's lots of kind of smaller JNI calls. Like within each operator, there's a JNI call to, to, to kind of run that section. Got it. And then uh, if you're going to get to this, uh, stop me, but like, you know, you support 111 uh, operators of Spark. Is there is there a challenge with the semantics of an operator in data fusion conflicts or is slightly different than what, what what Spark would expect, and therefore, 
you might get slightly different output. I mean, obviously, string uppercase is, is an obvious one, but like, are there other co corner cases? Like, just thinking of like the Velox paper, they talk about how the Presto semantics were slightly different than Spark semantics, and that was a big challenge for them of getting Velox to handle everything. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's where a lot of the work is in if, if for all of these accelerated projects is trying to match Spark's behavior, which can be, you know, it can be kind of quirky in some cases. Um, but data fusion in general is aiming for Postgres compatibility. And yes, there, there are differences there. I, I will give one example of that later on. Okay. Um, but particularly it's around things like casting between types, um, like date timestamp passing, how, you know, those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Um, so from an end user point of view, if you wanted to use commits, it's very simple. Um, you download a jar file from Maven and you, you, you add that to your configuration and you specify to use the Spark plugin, look uh, called Comet plugin. And um, yeah, just to work through an example of what this looks like in a bit, a bit more detail at kind of the plan level, again, using TPTH query one, which is a, a single table aggregate query. So this at the top here is the, the Spark physical plan, um, which is, you know, I showed this earlier. And at the bottom is the, the comet plan after this has been translated. So this is still, this is like Scala classes. This is happening in the driver. And the only differences you see here really is that everything has a comet prefix. Um, and fully exchanges in this example, there's two different types of exchange. There's a comet columnar exchange and then a, col a comet exchange. The reason for that is we have two implementations right now. Comet exchange is a, is a native one where it's like creating native arrow data to the shuffle file, and that's our ideal use case. Um, but it doesn't support all of the uh, different types of partitioning yet. So in some cases, we fall back to one that has more kind of JVM code running. And that's something obviously we're kind of improve over time. So that's the Scala plan in the driver. And then when we get to the executor, uh, we, we now translate this into the data fusion plans. And this is happening not for the overall plan, but for each of those individual query stages as they get scheduled. So starting at the bottom here is the, the first native plan where we have a, the Comet scan exec, and this is where it's reading from Parquet. We've got a filter projection, partial aggregates. The output of this is going to a shuffle file. And then moving up when the next query stage runs, we see another scan exec. And in this case, we see the source is an exchange. So here we have like some back and forth with the JVM. So the native, the native code now essentially is, is, is it has to get data from the JVM that Spark has retrieved from like the, the shuffle exchange that's happening. Um, and again, the output this one goes to another shuffle set of shuffle files, and then the final, like the final uh, query stage runs, if that makes sense. So as well as, um, so that's the general like overview of how it all works in terms of the, the plan translation, um, how, how, the, how that all gets executed. Comet also provides an accelerated Parquet reader. So the motivation for this, um, so normally in Spark, Spark has two different um, like data source APIs and implementations. There's a, a V1 API, which is all row-based. There is a V2, which is columnar, but it's reading into like a Spark columnar format. And because Comet and Data Fusion were all arrow-based, we wanted a Parquet reader that would read to, like directly into arrow format at the start rather than having to do like a translation. And um, we also wanted to leverage native code to do the decoding. So yeah, to remove that kind of overhead. And um, Iceberg is actually working on integrating this into um, their product as well as like an optional feature to accelerate their, their Parquet reads. Um, so just to, so tying that into the overall execution, this is all within the executor now. So on the left, we have the JVM code and on the right, the native code. Um, so kind of starting at the top left, the Comet Parquet reader is handling um, like reading bytes from Spark's API for the file systems. It has, you know, this, all of this great support for different file systems. So the IO, the IO decompression is happening at, at that level and then calls are made into native code on the right-hand side to decode those bytes directly into Arrow record batches. And then on the left, Essentially, this is the Volcano model. Spark is calling next on the Comet executor race, which is calling next on the Parquet reader. And as those batches are flowing through, the Comet executor race is calling execute plan on the native plan. And that processes the that, 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 that record batch that's available and then produces an output record batch. 
which maybe goes for shuffle file, maybe ends up coming back to JVM, depending on the plan. Um, and that that's kind of the process that happens until all of the, the batches are exhausted. I guess, Porter, I get, are there any questions at this point? I don't feel like I'm kind of flying through this a bit. I think you're good. Okay. So yeah, so, so yeah, so there are some challenges building a Spark accelerator in general. Um, some are specific with data fusion, some are more general. Um, so in terms of like data fusions, one thing we run into Spark's data type system represents logical types, an arrow, and therefore data fusion, that type system represents physical types. So where Spark has a string type, in arrow we have UTF-8, large UTF-8, we have the, the German style strings now with UTF-8 view, and then we also have like dictionary encoded strings. Um, so, we, so we run into some issues there. With data fusion end-to-end, -end, um, all of the type coercion happens in the logical optimizer. But because we're working, we're, we're just going straight from a Spark physical plan to a data fusion physical plan. We don't have any. We don't have those type coercion rules. So there's some extra work we have to do, kind of duplicating work that happens in data fusions, like the logical layer. Um, and that's something we can maybe um, kind of donate back to the project. For, you know, there may be other, you know, other other people building things just using the physical layer, but this could be useful. And one consequence of this right now is that we're not taking. We're not taking full advantage of some of the optimizations around dictionary encoded arrays. So we tend to kind of unpack things a bit earlier than we, we need to just to just to simplify things right now. But that's kind of just the, the kind of the early stage of the project. You mentioned Spark compatibility. So yeah, we want to we want to have the same behavior as Spark, even for edge cases. Um, in some cases, we have an implementation that isn't 100 percent compatible with Spark, but pretty close. Uh, we disable it by default, and users can choose to opt in if they if they that are aware of the you know potential risks with that. Um, we have a compatibility guide that, that goes into that in detail. And some of the areas, this is just like some of the areas where we see differences. Uh, negative zero is one. So uh, like Rust and Java have different implementations of IEEE 754. And you know whether, whether zero and negative zero are equal or how they sort can vary. And Spark actually has specific logic for normalizing negative zeros and not a number. Before certain like arithmetic expressions, and we have to we have to do the same thing in Comet to make sure we get the same results. Um, Spark has what it calls ANSI mode, um, which basically, um, if you have expressions that could potentially cause a numeric overflow, with ANSI mode enabled, um, an exception should be thrown. If ANSI mode is disabled, then you expect just a null value instead. So it's another area where we have to do the same thing. Data fusion does have this concept for some expressions, but not all. Um, and again, again, this is something that could potentially be um, contributed back to data fusion and have more, more options around this. Casting was a big one initially. Um, just Spark has a lot of very specific behavior about how certain data types are cast. And often the behavior is also impacted by like a bunch of different configuration options that you can set. Some of it to support legacy behavior from older Spark versions. So it's something else we have to take into account. And just date and timestamp in general. Anytime those are being passed from string, um, that yeah, there's there's, there's like a lot of kind of very specific behavior we have to match. So without going into details of of like Apple's workloads, like are these these various compatibility issues you're facing, is it like you know, like 99% of the of the program Spark Pro queries don't have this issue and just sort of cleaning up 1%, or are these pretty uh, pretty common? And therefore, like, just to have a Spark Accelerator, you got to knock these out right away. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, it, the difficult thing, like, also with my previous one, like, at NVIDIA, like, we don't really know what users are using this for. We don't get to see everything that people are running with this. At the end of the day, we're kind of providing a jar file. So, so we have to kind of err on the side of just, yeah, we have to kind of knock these out early on and just try and make it as compatible as we can. And, and where we run into things that would require like a ton of engineering effort, we can choose to have it as like an optional feature that people can turn on and we explain what the differences are. Like, and you mentioned it like earlier, like string uppercase, lowercase. That's another thing that can vary like with UTF-8 encoded data between Rust and Java. And yeah, for ASCII data, it's the same. So mm -hmm. we have that disabled right now, but you can turn it on. And if, if you have ASCII data, there's really no risk. Um, if you have UTF data, it might, being, it, you might end up with a slightly different result, not necessarily a wrong result, just a different, you know, different interpretation. Got it. Okay.
Um, how do you test the compatibility? Do you run the uh, do you run the Spark tests on uh, with accelerators? We do, and that's actually the next slide after this. Well, yeah, absolutely, we'll cover that. That's a good question. Um, but before before I jump to that, here's just one example. So this is casting string to date. Uh, so we've got the inputs on the left, then Spark's result and Data Fusion's result. So Spark supports, it's just very flexible. Um, it supports partial dates and times. Um, my favorite is the T2 at the bottom there. Big fan of the C2 movie, um, but that's a valid timestamp apparently. So T is the delimiter between the date and the time, and two represents the hour too. Um, so, so data fusion in its own doesn't support that. So what we have to do in Comet is basically implement our own version of that expression, and we have to port the logic from Spark over to yeah. And I mean Spark also support well, that actually doesn't anymore, but it used to support strings like now, today, tomorrow as well. Which doesn't make a lot of sense to store that in a in a parquet file, but you never know. So testing, um, yeah. So we we absolutely take Spark's test suite and we run it with Comet enabled um, and make sure those tests pass. We have our own unit integration tests, which use random JSON generation because we want to hit those edge cases, and then we also do full fuzz testing. Um, it's a little, it's actually pretty primitive right now, and it's something I'm sure we're going to you know get get more advanced with. But we literally just generate random parquet files um, with you know lots of columns, different data types. Then we generate random queries against those files. We run those queries against just regular Spark, against Comet, and compare the results. And early on, that found like a ton of like low hanging issues around casting and those kind of things. And here's an example of an issue um, that was filed based on a fuzz testing tool. Which is, and the fuzz testing tool is all part of the open source repo. So at the top there, there's the SQL query. It's just selecting two columns and then uh, a division, like column A divided by B. There's an order by clause just to keep it like, hopefully deterministic. Um, we see the Spark plan and the Comet plan. And then at the bottom there, we see the difference. So this was dividing a negative floating point number by a negative floating point zero. Spark produces null. Comet at the time was producing infinity. Um, is either of those right or wrong? I don't know. But anyway, so that, that's a bug we fixed now. And now, now we, 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 we come up with the same answer that, that Spark has. Wait, so it's, it's a number divided by negative zero? Yeah. It should be uh, invalid, should there be an exception. So in Spark with anti mode enabled, absolutely. Well, I say absolutely. Eventually, yeah, that, that may be an exception. I'd, I'd have to check that one. Um, yep. Okay. So challenges, so now come, come back to performance. So if we look at where Comet is today and look at the other, and it's not a fair comparison because um, this is inside Spark, but if we look at Blister and Rain, you know, there's a difference in performance there. Um, so, so why is that? Why, why is Comet not as fast as these other things? And before I dive into that, also here's just a like CFCDS, uh one terabyte running in the cloud, which is like more of a realistic kind of enterprise benchmark. Um, so, so we are seeing like acceleration of a lot of the queries. The the overall speed up in this case isn't like very exciting yet. Um, but yeah, it, it is, it, we, we see the basic acceleration happening. So we're kind of heading there. But for to get like to improve our TPCH results, the first part is that we're we're not actually running all of the queries fully natively yet. Um, and the reason for that is there are some features that we just haven't implemented. So it, so with the data fusion distributed systems, we're using data fusion's query planner. And obviously, that produces things that Data Fusion supports as a physical plan. But when we're using Spark's query planner, we see things that are different. So, so for example, Spark uses a, a Bloom filter aggregation for some of these queries, and Data Fusion doesn't have an equivalent of that yet. So, so, we, so for those queries, we kind of fall back to Spark at some point. Um, sort merge join with a join condition is another one that actually is implemented in Data Fusion quite recently. Uh, but we're still kind of working through some performance issues with that one, so it's not enabled yet. So in this case, where we... Andy, I actually opened a pull request today for the Bloom filter aggregation. Oh, awesome! Okay. Thanks. Oh, nice. Nice. Cool. So yeah, no, so, so the project's pretty early. So yeah, we're kind of we, we are onto these things. Um, but until we run all the queries like fully natively, we're just not going to see the same benefit. And and so so yeah, where we do have the situation where we fall back to Spark. Um, so we're going from native columnar to JVM row-based. And Spark will be inserting these transitions. 
So there's like rows of columns, columns for row. Um, those are implemented in, in Spark and JVM, and they're not impl- they they weren't designed to work well with what we're doing with Arrow. So what we really need to do is um, implement native versions of those. Um, so so basically, the, the issue is that Spark, in the case where we're going column to row, Spark has this interface it uses for accessing individual values. So we're calling like get string one on this row, get string two on this row. And each of those calls ends up being like a JNI, JNI call in some native code. Um, what we need to do instead is have native code that can build like a whole Spark row in memory and kind of pass that back to uh, make that, that process more efficient. And obviously, ideally, once we support more things natively, we don't even have to do these transitions. I mentioned earlier about the data type kind of mismatch issues. So right now, um, when we read from Parquet, we do have dictionary encoded data and things like filter run against that. Uh, but we always unpack those dictionary arrays before joins right now. And that's something that I'm sure we can avoid, but it will require, uh, yeah, it's going to require some engineering work to do that, to get those kind of benefits. Another issue, because we're using data fusion, just the physical plan, we're not, we're not using its logical optimizer. Um, for TPC, we actually see some queries where there's one expression that's, uh, that features like multiple times in the same query. And for some reason, Spark hasn't, you know, there's an optimizer or common sub-expression elimination which should recognize that and just evaluate it once. For some reason, that isn't happening in Spark. Um, because we are using data fusion at the physical level, um, we don't have a, a physical optimizer rule to do that. So data fusion has a logical rule for this, but not a physical one. So we need to implement that rule um, to, to get a speed up on a couple of those queries. Are there any plans to use a uh, just in time compilation for the query like like uh, done in uh, Spark? So I missed part of that. Any plan to use uh, 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 Spark to, uh, as you said, uh, to speed up uh, generate bytes code uh, to, for for the query? Are there any plans to do just in time code gen? Go gen, right? It, I mean, not there, there aren't any like concrete plans right now. I'm kind of curious about it. So, so at one point, Data Fusion had a, a JIT module where they were doing uh, co generation, and they eventually removed it. They they found that they weren't getting a, a benefit from that. Um, just personally, I'm kind of curious about that. I'd, I'd like to experiment with it. Um, but, I would say, um, I, can I chime in? I say the current sure. research shows that a well implemented vectorized uh, uh, engine. Is will perform as good, if not better, than a than a cogen one. Okay, okay, thanks. You you saved me some uh, some research time there. Cool. Yeah. So I mean, I guess yeah, because we're processing things in batches and it's factorized. Yeah. That, I mean, it kind of makes sense. But uh, any, any other questions? Okay. So um, so that, that's. I, I, I think Prakash, you have a question. Yes. So. So, Andy, did you have to do anything special to support adaptive query execution in Spark? No, not at all. Sp- I mean, yeah, so Spark's doing all of the scheduling, all of that, breaking the query down into query stages. It's just when when the a, a query stage goes from executor, like it's at the very last mile of the whole process where we jump in and translate it to native. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. So this this is kind of mostly kind of TPCH. Some of it's kind of generic, um, but aside from trying to get better TPC benchmark numbers, um, there are other things we want to look into. So I mentioned all these transitions that could be expensive. Um, I'd, I'd like to explore having a cost based optimizer, uh, kind of a simple one where we have a cost model for Spark and a cost model for Comet, and we can just kind of tell upfront like if there's a bunch of transitions, like are we actually going to accelerate this or is it going to be slower? And then, you know, just avoid trying to accelerate in cases where we're not going to be helping. Because um, right, and right now, so right now, we the, for each query stage, we start native if we can. And then if we fall back to Spark at some point, we stay with Spark for the rest of that query stage. It would be possible to have like more transitions and go back and forth more if the transitions were more efficient. But it kind of depends what these other operators are. Like it, it, it would be... It wouldn't make sense to do a transition just to do something like a projection and then another transition. If it's like an expensive operator, maybe it's worth it. So uh, like a cost-based optimizer could potentially help there. And other than, so TPCH is very, in, in my opinion, it's very much kind of about OLAP like um, workloads. 
Um, you know, there's ETL, Spark used for a lot of ETL. Um, so, you know, regular expressions, like messy stuff converting between different file formats, like maybe JSON strings embedded in Parquet files. I think it's important to have some benchmarks around those use cases as well. So we're not just like, like over-optimizing for TPTH. I'm not, I'm not aware of, um, I don't know if there are any kind of industry standards benchmarks there or not, but um, yeah, something we need to look into. And then, yeah, so uh, then there's also ongoing performance optimization work upstream in data fusion and narrow. And, you know, we, we generally tend to benefit automatically from that work. So I know there's some work um, happening at the moment to improve performance for groups, aggregate queries for some specific use cases. Um, so, you know, we, we should benefit from those too. Um, so related to performance, Spark has a UI where you can see like a visual representation of the plan, um, has a bunch of nice metrics. Um, we say it's so a data fusion has its own metric system. We take those, once that native plan is executed, we take those metrics and we feed it back into Spark's metric system. So here um, highlighted, so we have a, a, a native scan that's happening and we can see the, the time spent in the like Parquet native decoding and the time creating the arrow like, vectors here. So that's kind of useful to spring between the debug these like any any performance issues. Um, and then yeah, moving on to roadmap. So you know this is an open source project. Obviously there, there are things that um, like Apple are going to want to like work on, but um, it's very community driven as well. One area of focus right now, um, we've mostly focused on just like primitive data types, which is all you need for things like TPTH. But we're starting to add support for structs and arrays now. At some point, we need to get to maps. Um, and you know every combination of structs containing maps containing arrays. Um, so that's definitely a, like a good area for, for contributing. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Spark has a, a lot of expressions, and we just need to keep you know keep keep implementing more and more of those so we can run more things natively. And then there's one really interesting um, kind of initiative like that came from the community around PyArrow UDFs. So Spark supports Python UDFs that can use the PyArrow API for processing, you know, obviously Arrow column the data, um, but Spark's row-based. So the way Spark handles this is it will do, it will, it will insert this row to column in their transition, call the Python UDF, which can process that column the data, produce column the data, then perform a column to row transition to go back to Spark. Obviously that's like a lot of overhead. Um, I mean, depending on how heavy the UDF is, uh, but with Comet, because we're already Arrow native, we could avoid those transitions. And for like the Python UDF use case, that could be, um, you know, that, that could be uh, like a really, really valuable feature. Um, yeah, so obviously I'd like to pitch for people to get involved in the project. There's a lot of work to do. Um, there, there are a bunch of good first issues tagged in the repo, but the easiest way to really start contributing is to go download a jar file try out comments on some of your existing Spark jobs and let us know, you know, if you run into performance issues or bugs. Um, also let us know if you see good performance. And um, yeah, lots of areas to help around kind of performance tuning and improving metrics and and yeah, and the, those kind of first issues. So that's kind of everything I had. Um, yes, yeah, so thanks for listening and happy to take more questions. Uh, do you, are you familiar with any company that uh, use that? That's using Comet right now? Yeah, yes, except for Marple, of course. Sure. Um, not specifically. I mean, that there are there, there, there are some contributors who have been finding bug reports and then find, like creating PRs to fix those bugs. So yeah, people are trying it out. Um, you know, things get helped often don't don't know where those people are working. So yeah, I don't have um yeah, no, I don't have specific company names to give you. So it's not bad at the studios. It's not it. Sorry, not part of like Spark distro. Or... No, uh, I said it's testing. not battle tested. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I still still missed that. Battle battle tested. Oh, sorry, battle tested. No, it's not. No. So it, this is a new project. So you know, it was donated in February. We just had a zero dot three dot zero release, just to give you an idea of where we're at. So it is early on. Um, you know, I would expect people to find bugs right now with this as they're testing. Um. And it'd be great to get that feedback of people trying us out and helping us get it, um, yeah, get it kind of production ready. All right, so I'll, I'll applaud on behalf of the audience. Uh, we have time for a couple questions for Andy. Uh, if you want, um, anybody wants to um, yourself and go for it. 
Uh, hello, Andy. Uh, may I ask you whether you have considered Apache Guten before? Like, how how is this project compared with that? It's a good question because, like, architecturally, there are a lot of similarities. I think I don't I don't know for sure. It is me just kind of speculating. But when this project started, uh, Gluten wasn't Gluten. It was like an Intel project. It wasn't part of the Apache Foundation, and that that potentially was yeah maybe a reason why that that wasn't um, kind of chosen as a foundation for this. I think it's just um, a lot of these big, big kind of enterprise companies they're more comfortable with like Apache with the governance there. Um, but the, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of similarity architecturally. And I actually did hear um, the Apache Kylin uh, people. I think a lot of them are eBay. I heard they're working on another accelerator, which is using Gluten, but with Data Fusion as a back end. Um, but this is just like um, I haven't seen any like code out there for that yet. But that'd be kind of interesting. I guess people like building these Spark accelerators. Okay, thank you. Hi, Andy. I had a similar comment uh, or question. Have you, uh, did you consider uh, VLOX, especially since there's some effort now to have VLOX also work on GPUs? Does that, is that interesting for you, having multi-platform uh, support like that, or uh, uh, Intel AMD processors are really what you're targeting here? Sure. So um, I wasn't part of the project when they decided to use Daddy Fusion, basically. I'm kind of there as a result of that decision. So um, I think, again, it, a lot of it maybe comes down to the fact that all of this is part of, like, it's one project within Apache, whereas, like, Gluten Plus Velox, it's two projects controlled by two, or at the time controlled by two different companies. That may have been part of the reasoning, but I, I don't know that for sure. Um, and I think at this point, yeah, we're kind of... Um, kind of committed to this this kind of path for now. Makes sense. Thank you. Sure. So, so one the, more question. I got, go ahead. So, so my question was, does uh, data, does Comet rely on Rust to generate the SIMD instructions or is it, uh, is it handed in? Um, Sure. So yeah. So so Comet is is using Data Fusion as a library. Data Fusion is using the Arrow library. Um, Arrow provides like all of the compute kernels which leverage SIMD, uh, and we rely on Rust's auto vectorization support. There, so we're not like we're not hand coding SIMD instructions. We just re rely on the Rust compiler to make that happen. Okay. This might be an annoying question because. You might not know what photon code looks like because it's proprietary, but what are like, from what you understand, what are the key like design differences between this and photon? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I haven't seen the codes so again, speculation, but I think it's very similar. I think if you're comparing like VLOX, Data Fusion, and Photon C code, I imagine you know, it's all vectorized. I imagine there's a lot of similarities. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware that Photon's using Arrow as its memory format. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know for sure. Um, so that's one difference. And and why like why why does anybody care about using Arrow? Well, in in the case of supporting Pi Arrow UDFs, that's like really useful. So in terms of being able to enable different integrations, I think having something that's based on Arrow is a good choice. And though VLOX is largely Arrow based um, as well, or you know, very, very similar. Okay. Uh my last question would be, are there any like design decisions that you originally made in data fusion that have caused problems when you try to then build Comet and have like Spark be a wrapper around it? I mean, obviously, sure. data types are obvious, but are there any sort of more fundamental things of like the core architecture itself? Like specific to Comet, I, I don't think so. I mean, um, I can't think of anything specific to Comet. Really? Um, so boring answer. No, I can't think of any like design decision. I, I haven't been, yeah, I haven't had that experience of kind of regressing or what, you know, why is it done this way? Okay. Um, in, in terms of like, because, because Comet is sort of this wrapper thing that calls data fusion and it's, it's mm -hmm. doing the marshalling of data back and forth. But right. then again, if, maybe for the core of data fusion, is there anything independent of Comet that like, oh, that was a regret if, to make it work in Spark? Again, not specific to, um, really not specific. Yeah, the only kind of, the, 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 yeah, the only regrets I've had, there's like, there's been a few little design things here and there, which I can talk about, but it's not not specific to Spark. Yeah, I mean, if you could share those, it'd be great. 
and it's like a tiny thing um but like with the logical plan so like one thing early on like i thought proto buff was important for like serializing plans just to, you know for multi-language support but it's, it would also be nice just to be able to use Rust's built-in kind of survey capabilities mm -hmm. for serializing plans. And like this is one just one detail. So a logical plan generally should be very easily serializable. You know, it, it's referring to like column names and function names and so on. Um, but in the logical plan, we do have references to actual like structs, implementations of things. So like in terms of data sources, we have like a thing called a table provider trait and different implementations. And the logical plan like contains pointers to those things. I think one thing I would have done differently would be to have the logical plan just refer to things like by name. And then when you go to kind of execute that plan or translate it, you, you go and look up in some context or well, this name maps to this like implementation thing. So that's just like one small thing I would have done differently.